your uh, reference to Acts chapter 3 is where we have been on Wednesday nights, the past couple of Wednesday nights, where the lame man is asking for money, and Peter and John say, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And we went from chapter 3, we were in chapter 4, where Peter and John are now getting in trouble because of what God has done and offering their hearts and their lives. And so now that they're having trouble with people, and we took that to talk for a little few minutes on Wednesday night on what do you do, how do you handle toxic people? How do you handle people who don't like you? How do you handle people that are sometimes butting heads against you? And there was enough response to that that we went ahead and pulled out the 11 bullet points that we talked about Wednesday night on how to deal with toxic people, and we printed those out, and I have them right here, and I have them right here. So if there's somebody who is toxic in your life, maybe they're here this morning, you don't want to see them, you get this. <laughs> Just call us, we'll make sure the door's unlocked later on in the week. But we have these guidelines for how to deal with toxic people right here. They're also at the information board out in the lobby underneath the Love God section of our vision statement. So how to deal with toxic people. And give me one more because we're coming up on one of our big outreaches of the year, and that is our Winning Edge outreach where we go into the prisons and the public schools in the area, if you want to be a part of that, you have to go to the winningedge.us and sign up. I would strongly recommend you do this. I have loved going into the prisons the past five or six years that we have done this. It has just been an amazing experience. You don't have to go into the prisons. You can help be on one of the cook teams. You can be on one of the teams that goes into the schools that they're doing this year. But if you want to be a part of a phenomenal outreach, which is the last weekend in December, go to the winningedge.us or see me after the service. Amen. Last Sunday, well, even the Sundays before that, we have been looking at I am a church member, and I wanted to come behind that and talk about something that kind of connected with it that brings us to the next section of what we do at our church every year at this time. And last Sunday, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, as we talked about it's time to fulfill your destiny. And out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we looked at who you are, why you are, and whose you are to figure, to figure out uh, what is God's calling on our heart and in our life? And we also came out of Isaiah chapter 46 where God said, I know the end from the beginning. That God knows the end route. He knows what the goal is going to be and he knows where you are. And he puts together this path to get you there. How many of you know that path is not a straight line? Can I get a witness here this morning? I can guarantee you neither Andy or Karen, when they were six-year-olds, said, I am going to be a missionary to Mexico. And for this straight line, all it did was built up to that point in time. No, there are detours. There are bumps on the road. There are things that can take you down another path that are kind of good and pleasing, but it's not the best thing for you. There's trouble that comes along. So God knows the end from the beginning, but he says, in order to get you there where you need to be, I'm going to have to have you have these experiences along the way so that when you get to that point to reach your destiny, you are prepared for that. All of that was directed toward the goal of you and I discovering our destiny. I didn't know it, but I was destined to be your mama. I did the best I could. You did good, Mom. Well... I happen to believe you make your own destiny. You have to do the best with what God gave you. What's my destiny, Mom? You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. Life is a box of chocolates for us. You never know what you're going to get. Good movie. I love it. And the theology is that close, but it's not exactly right. You don't make your own destiny. The way you discover your destiny is by finding the one who knows where your destiny is. God knows where he wants you to wind up. He has declared the end from the beginning. So to figure out your destiny, the first thing you have to do is make sure you find God and get in line with what God has for you. Because as we all know and have testified, there are going to be some bumps in the road, some detours to pull us away from that destiny. It was August of 2003, and it started in Canada with a power grid glitch and all of a sudden, from Canada all the way down to the northeastern seaboard, states, millions of people, there were power failures. 
And a friend that, that I know of was in New York at that time. He's in LaGuardia Airport in line, and they're standing in line for hour after hour after hour. And he finally he goes and says, is there a problem? So I'm going to say, well, the computers are all down. We don't know what's going on. And then an hour or two after that, they said, we're going to have to shut the airport down. Everybody leave the airport because they knew what was happening on the power grid that the entire city of New York in just a matter of moments was going to be completely dark. The, one of the largest cities in the world at night and not a single light. There's no power. There's no lights. There's no hot meals. There's no air conditioning. There's nothing. So this friend, he gets on this phone and he calls his travel, said, travel agent says, I've got to have a room very quick. And they calls back and said, there is one room left at the Crown Plaza, LaGuardia. They're going to hold it for you for 10 minutes because there's a line of people trying to get lines off in the airport tonight. If you're not there in 10 minutes, you don't get the room. Hops in a cab. They run over to, to the Crown Plaza. They get the room. There's candle lights all in the lobby. They hand them a flashlight. They got to walk up the stairs by flashlight to get to their room. There's no air conditioning. Again, one of the largest cities in the world, no power whatsoever. After a few minutes in their room, they think, if we can just open the window, maybe, or see if we can get some fresh air, maybe they're So they pull back the curtain, and across the street from the Crown Plaza is the Marriott. The Marriott is lit up. You can smell the aroma of hot food. There's music. People are laughing. And he says, what in the world? So he grabs the flashlight, goes down the stairs again, across the street, into the Marriott, and they've got a buffet lined up that they're feeding all these people, and the air conditioner is blowing fresh air and cool air, and the lights are in there, and the music is playing. He says, what's going on? All of New York City is without lights, no power. What's going on over here? And he said, when we built the Marriott, we planned for this type of event. We have a separate basement. And in our basement, there is a natural gas generator. So we have lights, we have power, we have music. We have power on the inside that is not dependent on the circumstances on the outside. What's working on the inside overrides what is not working on the outside. Is there anybody here this morning who would say, where I'm at right now ain't working? If I were to call suicide hotline today, they would put me on hold. My twin forgot my birthday. <laughs> if you're anywhere near that, you're in the right place today because God has a word for you today. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 20, 29, 11 is a good verse in a bad chapter. It's a bright verse in a dark chapter. Because the nation of Israel at the time of this that is written, they're in the dark. There's no power there. There's no spiritual power. They have abandoned God, and they are in Babylonian captivity. They have been taken away to a foreign land, and they're, on the, they're captives there. They're in a place they don't want to be. They're in a place that they can't figure out how they want to get to where they want to be. Yet it is in that place God says, I've got a plan for you, and that plan is to give you hope. And hope is about knowing where you are going. Hope is about the end from the beginning. In just a few moments after this church is over, you're, after church service is over, you're going to get in your car, and you are going to back out of your parking lot. I hope you look into that little rearview mirror before you back up, or you have one of those little fancy cameras that you can see back there. And you're going to make sure that nobody's behind you, and you are going to back up properly, and that is going to get you set on the path in the right direction to get where you want to go for lunch or home or wherever it is you are going today. Now, once you get moving in the direction you need to be going, I hope you do not focus on that little mirror anymore. I hope you look at that big windshield because I want you to be looking forward where God is taking you. Because if you continue to look in that rearview mirror, you're going to create problems for everybody around you. Now, what is real in the physical is also real in the spiritual. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows where he wants you to land, and he has taken you on this path. And sometimes by our own decisions, we have made wrong choices, and it has put us in a bad spot. And what happens, what hinders us from reaching that destiny, from reaching the end plan that God has for us, is that we focus only on what is behind. And the past is not the biggest hindrance to you reaching the destiny. It is finding God because God knows where he wants to take you. 
So if it weren't for my ex-wife, if it weren't for my last job, if it weren't for the way my parents raised me, if it wasn't for what happened 30 years ago, the destiny that God has for you is in front of you because that is hope. Hope never deals with anything in the back. Hope deals with things that are in the front. But Rick, you don't understand. I've got all these problems. It's too late. Can you get time back? No, you cannot. But we serve a God who said, I can restore what the locust took from you. I can restore what was destroyed in you, and I will bless back tenfold, a hundredfold of what you had before. You cannot skip the designer to get to your destiny. Young people in the room this morning, high school, college, you got plans. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to accomplish that. Do not leave God out of your plans. I, how many in this room wish you could go back knowing what you know now and do a few things over again? No, 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 no. All, all of us would be right there. We, we know that. We get that. And we try to explain to the young people, and you think about this, consider this, but don't leave God out. You have to have the designer in in order to reach your destiny. Find the one who knows where your destiny is. Now, as we started talking about last week, destiny may be simply being a good mother, as we saw Sally Field portray in the movie. It may be in a good father. Destiny doesn't mean you got to go climb Mount Everest or you have to have an audience with the Pope or you become even a missionary to Africa. Your destiny can be something that is just right for you, just designed for you. Your particular spot, just where God calls you, where he's going to get you to that spot. And the thing that makes a church work right is that everybody grasps and understands that and finds that somewhere in the process of all that. And this is the spot. This is my place in the body. And every year about this time, we do the campaign, Your Place in the Body. Because what we do during this time is that we, this is the spot where you sign up for where you're going to serve next year. Now, the next slide, please, Drew. We're changing the culture of Christian fellowship just a little bit. The word volunteer will never be used in this church again. We do not want you to volunteer we want you to serve in your gifting. We want you to serve in your calling. What is it that lights a fire in you? What is it that you enjoy doing? That is the thing you should be doing. Now, Rick, we need some help with this. We're, we, we may even pull up some spiritual gift inventories and tests and let you take those, some personality temperament things to find out what is the best spot for you. But what we have is, well, we need some volunteers. Well, I guess if nobody else is going to do it, I'll do it. Now, how well do you serve with that kind of an attitude? We want you to find out this is, what, this is what I love doing. We want to find a spot and let you do that. For example, let me, let me show you, that this, this is not just theory, this works. When we were putting together life groups to start up for this fall, one of the life groups, Deborah Norris, came to us and said, you know, she's an artist, she's a wonderful artist. But I would like to do a, a, a life group that, that paints and does art. And I'm thinking, well, who in the world is going to show up for that? We, we, we need a life group that gets together and watches the Cowboys game on Sunday. You know, that's, that's the kind of life group we need. And, and Pastor Leanne and Deborah were, well, maybe I can handle about eight or nine or ten maybe at the most. We had over 30 sign up for that class. When you find your gifting, when you find your calling, when you serve in that, God blesses, and that's what happens when you do that. So I'm not looking for anybody to volunteer in the nursery. Those days are over with. I want you to serve God and fulfill the calling he has placed in your life someplace in the function of this body. So find out what it is. Now, what, now what we do with that is that it fills out our mission of love God, love people, and change the world. You see that on everything we have. You got the little bulletin, it's on there. You get the little coffee mug, it's on there. It's all over the place. That's our vision statement. Love God, love people, change the world. Love God. If you love God, we believe you will come together one time a week, at least, and you will worship with him. We provide that opportunity for you on Sunday morning. We provide that opportunity on Wednesday night. Get together one time. Love God and worship him as a corporate body. Love people. We believe you need a smaller group than what's in this room. You need to get in some group that somebody knows your name. They know when you're not here. It's somebody you get to know over time. If there's a problem or prayer needs, you can call them. That's one small group. And then change the world. We want you in one ministry, one worship service, one small group, one ministry. Something that lights a fire in your heart that you need to be a part of and be doing. Now, in order to accomplish that, every year we have this little booklet, Your Place in the Body. And it has a spot where you can sign up. Now, we're going to be doing this probably over the next three Sundays as well, not just today. Because we know people are gone on Sunday, then come back, and they're gone for another Sunday, whatever. So over the next couple of Sundays, we're actually going to walk you through each one of these. 
And if there's something in here that's just not right for you and you've got a fire in your belly that's not here, you tell us about that and we'll see what we can do to provide for that. But here are some things to reach a destiny, still with a capital D, that you may not have thought was ever that important. The very first thing we put on there are first impressions ministry. That's our greeters, our connect team, parking uh, team, the coffee bar that is coming, and what we're now calling our roamers. Did you know people who visit a church, regular church people just move from out of town looking for another church, non-church, but it doesn't make any difference. They make a decision on whether or not they're gonna come back in the first seven minutes that they're in the building. That means they have made a decision if they are coming back before they hear Pastor Andy and Lana sing, before they hear me speak one word. They have already made that decision. That is how important our greeters are. That's how important our parking lot crew is. Not just for that, but for heaven's sakes. We just saw it in the news again. We gotta have some element and level of security in this on this campus, do we not? Now, the, 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 the greeters, Husbands and wives, that'd be great. If you, if you got a good smile, somebody says, I love your smile, and you like greeting people, can I tell you, part of your destiny may be to greet those people and make sure when they come in the door for the first time, somebody shakes their hands, they know that. If, if you're you're the one, that roamer. If somebody comes in for the first time and they look around, they're not sure where they're going, they've got a child, you don't wait for them. You walk up to them and say, how are you doing today? Do you want your child in children's church? They can stay with you. That's fine. But let me show you where children's church is. And you walk them down to children's church. You like coffee? We got some coffee over here. Come over here. You like sugar and cream? I'll put sugar and cream in your coffee for you. Can you imagine somebody who has never been to church before, are they left church when they were 20 because somebody griped about how long their hair was. And they haven't been back since, and they've gotten married, and they got kids, and they realize, you know what, at least I want my children to know the golden rule. So for the first time in 20 years, they have gone back to church, and the bad taste in their mouth of the church that they left them that, you are able to change that just that quick. That's how important that first impressions ministry is. And we're going to do some things with the coffee bar to get that going because people just like to get together and drink coffee. And we're, I don't, I'm not a coffee drinker. Somebody else can do that. It's a, it's a stupid ministry if you ask me, but we're going to have... <laughs> it ain't my destiny, you know. But, but, but the Connect Center, being there for the first time... You know, if, we've talked about this before. When you visit a church for the first time, that's an intimidating experience. Even if you are an outgoing person who loves people, visiting a church for the first time is unnerving. You don't know the culture of that church. Why are they standing up? Why are they doing this? Who is that wild child down there on the front row? Who is that? My heavens. Do they have a special needs ministry for him? What is going on? Help us out. They don't know. So, so they don't know, and you're the person back there who really makes the first connection because when they bring that card to you, you're able to answer some questions. You hand them that free coffee mug. You give them that Rayo's gift card. Our first impressions are so phenomenal. And can you imagine what it would be for the first-time visitor who has a child, and they go back to children's church, and they see our people, our, our parking lot crew, our security crew, with that red shirt on, and they're back there knowing that somebody's watching over my kids while I'm in the service today. See how important that is. That, is. that is filling someone's destiny. Real quickly, I want to cover one more. We'll cover about two a week. The second area you'll see when you pick these up, and by the way, they're at the, 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 on the altars, and I put them on the altar specifically because I want this to be a symbolically spiritual thing that you're doing. I want you to come to the altar to talk about bringing your gift, your talent, uh, and, and skills to the Lord. The next area is the sanctuary ministry. Ushers are so vitally important. There are some Sundays where it gets kind of full in here, and it gets, and if you're kind of, you know, there's two or three chairs here, but they need four chairs, and they just don't want to walk down an aisle and find who, those ushers need to be there. Say, hey, I got four chairs over here. Bring them over here. It takes care of that. Communion preparation. Communion is an important part of what we do, and the people who come here early that first Sunday of the month to put the communion trays together to clean up after that is vitally important. Prayer partners. At the end of almost every service, we'll have prayer partners up here. If you can pray for, you don't have to be Billy Graham. You, you, you don't have to pray a King James prayer. If you're here in a service, and we come to the end of the service, and it's a prayer time, and you see somebody come forward, and your mind kind of focuses on them. There's something that happens in your heart and your spirit that you have some empathy for them. You know what God is telling you? You have a prayer burden. You are a prayer warrior. You need to be a prayer partner. We're not, we're not looking for super spiritual people to, to, to be this. Just anybody who has a willing heart to just say a prayer over somebody who comes forward. Something new that's happening this year, our 826 prayer team. I'm looking for people who will join with me. I'm here most Sunday mornings in the sanctuary by 630 praying. But I'm looking for a group that will meet with me at 826 every Sunday morning. Now I'm going to put together a team. And what I'm asking is you only have to do this once every eight weeks. So once in January, you don't have to do it in February. You come back and do it in March. 
So I'm not inundating you with being here early. But I want a prayer team at 826 every morning to walk through the building and pray. To be in the sanctuary and pray. To go to every classroom and pray. To go to the children's church and the nursery and pray over the kids who are going to be in there. And the ministry that's happening in children's church that day, 826. Why 826? Romans 826 says, when you don't know how to pray, the Spirit prays through you. So that's why we're meeting at 826. We also need what we're going to call a VIP host. When we have special guests with us, like Andy and Karen, they may need some water if they're setting up a table with their mission stuff. We want somebody to take them and take care of them that whole time that they are here It's because we know how important they are to us and we're glad they are here and we want to take proper care of them. So if you kind of like that hospitality thing, well, I can do that. I can, I can make sure that their, their table is set up. I can make sure they're ready to go for lunch or whatever it is. You just kind of want to help out our special guests. That is there for you. But that is our first impressions and our sanctuary and ministry that are there. What is it that lights a fire in your belly? That's what we want you to do. No more volunteers. We are servants. We are ministers. We are people functioning within the gift and the talent that God has given us. And when we do, we see God bless tremendously. Do not be afraid of this. Grab it by the horns and run with it. Now let me go ahead and get this one out of the way. Rick, I've been a greeter, I've been an usher at this church for 15 years. Fill out the paper. <laughs> now, the reason we do this, the reason we do that is because if you get involved in a ministry and you find out this really isn't my thing. Say, for example, you're on the parking lot team. If we have enough uh, guys and gals to do that, we put together five or six teams, which means you only have to work in that maybe once or twice every other month. So if you find out you don't like the parking lot team, you only have to do it, what, about five or six more times. And then this time next year, don't circle that, and you're out of that group. So there's an easy exit out that doesn't place you in a position where you have to do something uncomfortable. But we do ask, if you do pray about this and you do sign up, we do want you to commit for the year. If you sign up to work in the nursery for the year and you're working every four weeks in the nursery, once once a month or once every six weeks, we need you to finish out the year because we have done our planning and our pastoral staff and our department heads have done that planning. So if you sign up, you're committed. I will hunt you down. (laughs) But if it's not right for you, there's an easy exit out. You just don't sign up next go around. But regardless of how many times you have done it, we need you to sign up for this year. A healthy church will always be a growing church. Maybe not numerically because there are, there are wonderful healthy churches that are in rural areas that, that the population is, is just stagnant. There's no growth there. But they're a healthy church because people have found their spot and they're doing what God has called them to do. That is fulfilling your destiny.